thank you so all for bringing us together in person, no less. I'm Zoe Weinberg, uh, and I'm pleased to kick off this morning with a discussion about America's role in the world and the future of national security. I have, we have with us today General John Kelly, former White House Chief of Staff and former Secretary of Homeland Security. We have General H.R. Oh, wait a minute now, and also a retired Marine. And also a retired, <laughs> retired Marine, most importantly. <clears throat> we have General H.R. McMaster, who is currently a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, previously National Security Advisor, and also a retired U.S. Uh, Army Lieutenant General. Uh, we have uh, Michelle Forney, who is the co-founder and managing partner of West Exec Advisors and formerly Under Secretary uh, of Defense for Policy uh, under President Obama. And we have Richard Fontaine, CEO of the Center for New American Security and former Foreign Policy Advisor at, in both the Senate and the White House. Welcome. I'd like to start where everybody's attention is focused right now, Afghanistan. Exactly one month ago, uh, the Taliban entered Kabul and took control of the presidential palace. Of course, historians are gonna be debating for many years uh, our role in the country, but with the events still very fresh, what are the lessons learned from both our decades long engagement in Afghanistan and from our withdrawal? General McMaster, I'd like to start with you. Well, Zoe, th thanks for the question. I, I mean, I think it is important that we learn the right lessons from, I think, what is a catastrophe uh, in Afghanistan. And I think the first step, you know, in, in learning the right lessons is to stop pretending. I mean, what we hear from Washington today about the situation in Afghanistan and the ramifications, the costs and consequences is exactly the opposite of reality. So we have to stop pretending you know, that, that we didn't surrender to a terrorist organization. We have to stop pretending that a lost war has no consequences. We have to stop pretending you know, that the Taliban is going to share power and be concerned about the opprobrium from the international community and modify its behavior. We have to stop pretending that the Taliban is not completely interconnected with Al Qaeda, the Haqqani Network, and lots of other terrorist uh, organizations. And we have to stop pretending that the consequences of this surrender to a terrorist organization and our precipitous retreat from Afghanistan will not have profound consequences in three areas. First, a humanitarian catastrophe, which is just beginning, just beginning. With our withdrawal, we have created not only a humiliating scene that is reminiscent, but worse than the withdrawal from, from, uh, from uh, Vietnam in 1975, but we're now on fast forward to a hostage crisis, more like 1979 in Iran, that is orders of magnitude larger and is, if, uh, is of our own creation not only for obviously U.S. citizens, uh, but also for Afghans who helped us and for the citizens of our allies and partners who were part of the, of the coalition. So that catastrophe is now just beginning, but that humanitarian catastrophe is related to the security catastrophe of a massive refugee crisis that also is a source of strength for jihadist terrorists who are, by the way, the enemies of, of all humanity. Those refugees will become a great recruiting pool for the 20 or so designated, U.S. designated terrorist organizations that are in the border area between Pakistan and Afghanistan. And we know, right, from 9-11, from right, we know from 20 years ago that when these terrorists control territory and populations and resources, they become orders of magnitude more dangerous. And what's sad in the area of lessons is we didn't learn from 9-11 and we didn't learn from an even more proximate experience which was our complete withdrawal in December 2011, when then Vice President Biden called President Obama and said, thank you for allowing me to end this goddamn war. Think about the conceit that underlies that approach to war. Wars do not end when one party disengages. And while we have been ha developing policy based on the mantra of ending endless wars, we should at least acknowledge the agency and authorship over the future that our enemies have and recognize that jihadist terrorists are fighting an endless jihad against us. And when we disengage from that problem set abroad, we can only deal with the consequences at an exorbitant price once that, once that threat reaches our shores. And, and then finally, it's a political catastrophe. 
political catastrophe in connection with our credibility. Deterring conflict really, I mean, depends on capability times will. Our adversaries and enemies now think our will is zero. And so this catastrophe is connected, I believe, and will be connected to more aggressive actions by the Chinese Communist Party. Just read the China Daily and what they're saying about Taiwan. Uh, it, it just it, it'll be connected, I, I think, to it is connected to the missile launches out of North Korea and the activity at Yongbyon. It'll be connected, I think, to more aggressive actions on the, on the part of the uh, Iranians uh, as, as well. Uh, and so we're in for a rough ride ahead. And it's going to be an even rougher ride because I think we have demonstrated our inability to learn lessons from even this ongoing catastrophe. Thank you. Richard, what are, what's your take on lessons learned and what are the implications for our longer term role in the region? Well, I think one of them is uh, the difficulty which, with which the United States has in solving some of its foreign policy challenges. Afghanistan is a good example. We constantly and continue to look for the solution. We're going to defeat the Taliban utterly. We're going to surge troops in. We're going to take them back. We're going to leave. Uh, something is going to solve it. Um, Iraq was a, a similar situation in 2011. Everything was about exit strategies, about solving a problem. And some of these problems can be mitigated. The threats can be of jihadist terrorism can be mitigated, uh, but they're not going to be solved in any sort of meaningful time frame. That's not very uh, conducive to our way of thinking, where we're going to get in, we're going to accomplish something, and then we're going to get out. And if we've been there for a long time, it must mean that we've done something very, very wrong, and we need to stop it. What that tends to do from in the greater Middle East in terms of military operations is a kind of yo-yo diet where, we, where we're on the ground with a certain number of forces. We're trying to do some things. doesn't seem to quite work out. We go really big. That sort of half satisfying. And then we say, well, nothing's going to work, so we come all the way down. Really, what we need is sustainability, sustainability over a long period of time. We need staying strategies as much as we need exit strategies for some of these kinds of things. And I think Afghanistan is a case in point where we we had too few at the very beginning, then we surged troops, then we came down, and now we say, well, it, it, it can't be won. Well, in fact, the uh, presence on the ground was never, our American presence was not going to topple, it was not going to defeat the Taliban, but it was going to prevent the government from being defeated by the Taliban. And those are two very different outcomes from an American interest and American point of view. And so to focus on sustainability and the mitigation of threats rather than uh, all or nothing in or out solving the threats once and for all and then coming home once they're done, I think is the, the main takeaway. But in fact, I think we're probably going in the opposite direction right now. General Kelly, both General McMaster and Richard have referred to the very real risk that Afghanistan may become a haven uh, uh, for terrorists. And there's been reports that the Biden administration has has considered or allegedly is considering uh, cooperating with the Taliban to com combat the ISIS affiliate uh, on the ground. I'm curious, how should we think about the terrorism threat in the country and the trade-offs of possibly cooperating with the Taliban uh, to, to reduce it? Well, the first thing I'd say is uh, the Taliban is a terrorist organization, as both these gentlemen have referenced. And they're aligned with all of the other radical terrorists, Islamic terrorists. Uh, and this war is not over in their mind. Uh, just because we withdrew doesn't mean the war is over. They're st we're still at war. Uh, this war will not be over for a long, long time. And it's not about um, our friendship with Israel. It's not about uh, you know, opportunity in the Middle East. It's, it's about who we are as a people. Uh, and until we either surrender to them, and I mean more than just surrender like we did in Afghanistan, uh, or we just simply defeat them over time. So the war is not over. So the idea that you can deal with the Taliban, you know, who are sworn uh, radical terrorists that have sworn to kill Americans and, frankly, anyone they, they can kill in the West, to say that you can work with them, uh, well, maybe, maybe there's smarter people in the White House than, than, uh, than I can imagine. I, I, I can't wait to watch it. But I, I just don't see it working. On that note, Michelle, where do we where do we go from here? Well, I think you know the the thing that makes this even more consequential is that it's happening at a time 
when we're really in a period of a strategic inflection point. You know, we've had 20 years focused on the post 9-11 period fighting terrorism. The problem has not gone away. It still needs to be managed. Um, but we have a new set of challenges, and particularly the rise of China as a great power, um, the continued presence of a revisionist Russia under Vladimir Putin, who's constantly trying to undermine democracy in Europe and here. Um, but we really have, a, we're in a new era where we are going to be in a major competition with a rising China that is very committed to changing the rules of the road, changing the rules for trade, changing the rules for use of force, uh, imposing its will on smaller countries, changing the architecture and the, the whole feel and operation of the Indo-Pacific region, which, oh, by the way, is the most important part of the world when it comes to the prosperity of Americans and the security of Americans here at home. So, you know, this point where we've just mismanaged uh, uh, withdrawal, which is, you know, it's a, the heart, I mean, these two gentlemen can confirm that one of the most dangerous parts of a military operation is coming out of it. Um, but we've, that's clearly been mismanaged. And, and I think U.S. credibility has taken a hit. Um, at exactly the moment where we need that credibility and we need that leadership to start uh, build, rebuilding alliances and partnerships and to try to take on and deter any kind of conflict with China, uh, constrain China's influence. And in certain areas like climate change and preventing the next pandemic, we've got to find ways to cooperate. So the world really needs U.S. leadership right now. And I think what's even though I think the president sought to get out of Afghanistan, wisely or unwisely, to free up bandwidth and energy and focus and resources to put to the Indo-Pacific, the truth is this has created such a mess that it's actually draining that bandwidth and refocusing it on the greater Middle East. Um, so I, I, am, I am concerned. I think the administration has made its own job much harder um, going forward to really focus on the major challenges we have in Asia. I want to stick with this for a second. You know, I, I think you're right in many ways. Uh, to a certain extent, we are closing the chapter on 20 years of very counterterrorism focused operations and shifting our focus toward great power competition and specifically competition with China, as you mentioned. Michelle, I mean, this is obviously a departure from the playbook of the early 2000s. Do you think, is the United States prepared to compete with China? And if, if not, what needs to change? Well, I think, I think we need a vision and a leadership engagement. I think we need to have a president to talk to the American people to say, this is one of those moments that Americans need to stand up and do what we're really good at. We are good at standing up out of, out of crisis, dusting ourselves off, coming back strong, whether it was the Great Depression or World War II or Vietnam. I mean, you can go through uh, the, the scenarios, the financial crisis. This is one of those moments where we've got to stand up, get, get around, turn the corner on COVID, get the economy moving again, reinvest in the drivers of our own competitiveness, re-embrace our allies and partnerships, but with a purpose that we are going to compete. We know how to compete when we're inspired to do that, and we need to do it economically, technologically, uh, in terms of defending democracy and militarily. And I'll just comment on the military piece. We do have the greatest military in the world, but we can't rest on our laurels. Um, we have to adapt, we have to transform, we have to innovate to be able to effectively show up and deter a, com uh, a country like China, which has spent the last two decades while we were focused in the Middle East, investing in the capabilities to try to keep us out of the Indo-Pacific. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, we have a lot of rebuilding of our diplomatic um, core and the ability to show up and shape things there. But so I, I, you know, if you ask me, would you rather have the Chinese hand of cards to play or the American hand of cards to play? I would far prefer to have our hand of cards, but we have to start playing those cards better if we're going to be successful. Yeah. So our, our allies obviously play a meaningful role here. And Richard, you've written about the need to unite democracies uh, to enhance digital cooperation through an alliance of techno-democracies. Will you tell us a little bit more about that concept and the role of multilateralism more generally? 
Sure. So when you're talking about this grand sort of U.S.-China competition, it's sort of natural to think, well, power is sort of shifting in the Chinese direction because they're becoming every year more powerful, richer, mil more militarily capable, more assertive, et cetera. The, the real way to think about it is not America on one side of the scale and China on the other, but China on one side of the scale and America and all of its allies and partners on uh, like-minded countries on one side, on the other side of the scale. And when you start to add up all the capabilities, the economy, uh, the diplomatic weight and everything, um, then, then you see quite what we have to work with in this grand competition of United States uh, and China and this contest of models of autocracy and democracy and, and things like that. Those are some of our greatest assets, our, our system of alliances, the like-minded nature of partners that want to work with us more than they did even in the past. Um, frankly, some of their apprehensions about China and its illiberal directions in which it's going. That then goes into, okay, so what are the new things that you do about this? And you're starting to see whether it's on the military front, on the diplomatic front with the Quad, with the US, Australia, India, and Japan, new frameworks there that the Trump administration really sort of um, revived and has now been taken up by this administration. So you're seeing these different kinds of ways of countries that are like-minded working together. And one that has not really come to the fore yet, but in my mind and the minds of others really needs to, is on technology. So right now, uh, there are technology aspects to gatherings here and there of the G7 and the US and the EU and others. There's no uh, forum, there's no group where you get like-minded democracies that are the advanced technological economies together to say, what is it that we really care about in terms of our democratic practices, our, our economic matters? What are we worried about in terms of the use of illiberal technology, surveillance technologies, Chinese innovation, et cetera, et cetera? And how do we actually work together uh, across uh, lines, both private sector and government sector to do this? It's the kind of thing that when you start to think about it, it's you start to, I, I think you start to say, well, it's almost amazing we don't have something like that now, given that technology is so key to everyday life, but also to this grand competition that we're in. And so to build a structure like that where the like-minded techno-democracies can cooperate, I think is a pretty near-term imperative. On the subject of technology, um, I want to step back for a second and uh, consider the role of technology in the evolution of conflict over time. Uh, some have argued that in that Increasingly, war is becoming less about kinetic combat on the ground and instead technological control, surveillance, cyber attacks, disinformation, stolen intellectual property. That is what's going to define the next era of war. General McMaster, do you agree with this assessment and, and what does that mean for militaries of the future? No, that's a pipe dream uh, because uh, those who say that really, really, really the next war will be fundamentally different from all those that have gone before it because of X technology. In the 90s, it was the combination of surveillance technologies, assured communications, space-based assets, precision strike capabilities, and GPS and so forth. And remember, we we're supposed to have a revolution in military affairs, right? Future war would be fast, cheap, efficient, and waged from standoff range. But what this kind of thinking neglects is there really, there are two ways to fight wars, asymmetrically and stupidly. And you hope your enemy picks stupidly, like Saddam Hussein did in 1991. But I think a lot of countries and, and, and jihadist terrorist organizations learned vicariously from the ass kicking of that army in 1991. And that's why you know, jihadist terrorists used box cutters and airplanes to bypass our technological military prowess and strike us asymmetrically. We also keep thinking that you know, really force on the ground, that doesn't make a difference anymore, right? Well, do you think it made a difference to the Taliban? I think it did. And when people say, hey, there are no military solutions to these emerging problems, we well, you know the Taliban had one, had one in mind. And what we, what we don't think about is the need to integrate all elements of national power and efforts of like-minded partners to achieve well-defined objectives in war. That's the essence of strategic competence. We are incompetent because we divorce these and we engage in strategic narcissism, essentially. We define the world as we would like it to be and assume that we can map out a linear course 
toward progress, right? The kind of wars we want to fight in the future, for example. We're going to invest in these fewer and fewer, more exquisite systems. Well, guess what? Hey, your adversaries have a say. They develop countermeasures. And so I would say that the element that, that is most important to thinking clearly about future war is to balance change, technological change, with continuities in the nature of war. And there are really four of those. War is an extension of politics. So you fight to achieve sustainable political outcomes consistent with your interests, like a political order in Afghanistan that is fundamentally hostile to jihadist terrorism. That would have been a good outcome. Afghanistan, as Michelle mentioned, didn't need to be Denmark, right? It just needed to be Afghanistan. Second, war is human. People fight for the same reasons Thucydides identified 2,500 years ago, fear, honor, and interest. What we hear these days is the Secretary of State and others saying, gosh, you know, it's not in the Taliban's interest, you know, to do X. Well, the Supreme Leader of the Taliban, Habitullah Akhundzada, his 17-year-old son was a suicide bomber. I mean, like, what else do you really need to know, right? Emotions and ideology drive and constrain the other as well. Third, war is uncertain, right? That, again, the future course of events depends not just on what we do, but what on the other decides to do. Remember in 2009, 2010, when President Obama announced the reinforced security effort in Afghanistan, he announced the timeline for our withdrawal at the same time and then said to the Taliban, hey, let's negotiate. President Trump actually doubled down on that approach. I mean, how does that work, right? And that really resulted in the capitulation agreement of February of, of 2020. And then finally, war is a contest of wills. What we hear a lot today, you know, we hear well, the Americans don't support a sustained effort in Afghanistan, even though it was a very low level and relatively low risk as the Afghans bore the brunt of that fight. And our European uh, coalition members bore a lot of that fight, flight as well. But, you know, it's not a surprise that Americans didn't support it because three presidents in a row told them it wasn't worth it. Right. So I think that we neglect at our peril continuities in the nature of war. Right. The historian Carl Becker said, the memory of the past and anticipation of the future should walk hand in hand in a happy way. And we engage in self-delusion when we think that really the next war will be fundamentally different from all those who've gone before it. Wars still resemble each other more than they resemble any other human activity. General Kelly, I'd love to get your perspective on this. What are the ways in which defense strategy may need to evolve and, and what are the places where there ought to be continuity? Well, the first thing is the United States and its very unique role in the world has got to be able to operate across the spectrum of warfare from cyber and all the rest to, you know, out and out war. Um, so that's the reality of it. The strength of the U.S. military, I would offer uh, before you even talk about technology and weapons and all that, are the people that are in it. Very unique people, very unique Americans. Uh, I would offer this in terms of uh, continuity. You know, the first war I was told as a young guy that I needed to get involved in was the Vietnam War. I didn't go to Vietnam, but that's the war where we were just had to get in there, had to stop, um, had to stop communism. Uh, and so an awful lot of people went in, 50 plus thousand killed. And then around the late 60s, Washington kind of lost interest in the war because politically it was not popular anymore. So we decided to, in my view, cut and run. And then the next time I was told that this was one of the most important things you could get involved in, young men, young women, was the Beirut effort. And that was fine until a bomb went off. And then again, Washington lost interest in that. And uh, then the next one, and the next one, and the next one. So you, you go to 9-11, and it's, uh, this is the most important thing young men and women can do. We've got, to, we've got to go, and we've got to fight terrorism in Iraq and Afghanistan. And 20 years later, we lost interest in that. When, when you start talking about conflict at the level, God forbid, with China, uh, and, the, and the potential casualties, and how fast those casualties Again, I'm, I'm not so sure if I was a young person uh, listening to uh, we really have to shift to China and the Indo-Pacific and really do what we need to do out there with the possibility of a war with someone like China. I'm not so sure uh, the, the continuity or the consistency in terms of how we've treated wars since World War II is you got to go in, you got to do it, 
and then we lose interest in it mostly because it's politically uh, unpopular. And then of course the politicians want to run run for it. So uh, I really wonder if uh, if we ought to uh, um, even consider the possibility of a conflict with with China, because I just don't think we have the staying power. The, the, the troops do. Uh, they'll go and do anything that they're told to do to, to their lives. Um, I'm not so sure, uh, though, that uh, that level of sacrifice is, is uh, can be maintained if there's a, a major war uh, uh, clash, if you will, with, with China or, for that matter, Russia. Any responses to that? Well, I, you know, my own view is that the name of the game is deterrence. Right. Um, and our efforts have to be to make the chi make sure that the leaders in Beijing understand that if they launch aggression, they can't be successful, or they will face such costs from the international community that they it's really not worth it. That they shouldn't take the action. They should try to work work things politically and diplomatically, and not mil through military means. But that means you know we got to show up in the region. Diplomatically, we have tons of embassies that are still empty, or at least ambassadorships. Um, we've got to show up in every major forum there to reassure people that we care, we're here. We've got to find some positive agenda for engaging you know, the region economically on trade. I think one of the biggest strategic mistakes that both the Democratic and Republican administrations made was not joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is a trade deal that we negotiated and set the standards for, high standards, and then all of our allies joined and we didn't. I mean, it was a, that's a sort of self-inflicted, you know, wound. But we got to show up and then we have to make the investments in the people and the technology and the concepts to make sure and demonstrate those concepts to make sure the Chinese understand that our military can inflict terrible costs if they try to move uh, aggressively uh, and unprovoked and against the rules of the the road. So I'm not I'm not suggesting that we should charge into a war with a, a nuclear power, but I think it's in our interest to double down on trying to prevent that war in every way possibility, but but on our terms, on terms that favor the like-minded states and the democracies that Richard is talking about. This is a competition between systems. We're, this, the stakes in this are, are we going to have a global order that is defined by free market democracies? Or are we going to have a global order that's defined by authoritarian states that are embracing a very oppressive surveillance-based model of governance? And I think, I think those stakes are pretty high. <laughs> I just, just to pick up on Michelle's point, I think it's important to recognize that China has has increased its defense budget by about 800% since the mid-90s. And what's important is deterrence by denial, is what Michelle's talking about, really the really convincing a potential enemy that the enemy cannot accomplish its objectives through the use of force. And I think it's important to kind of invoke, you know, the you know, the uh, the, the early 20th century philosopher and theologian G.K. Chesterton, who said that war may not be the best way of settling differences but it may be the only way to ensure they're not settled for you. And so it's, it's important for us, I think, to maintain military capabilities that are essential to deterrence by denial, but also to, re to, re to uh, capabilities that will allow us to, to protect our vital interests and, and, and our security against determined enemies from jihadist terrorists uh, to, you know, to the Chinese Communist Party if they were uh, going, to, going to employ um, you know, military force uh, against us. And I don't think the, the defense budget today, for example, is adequate to do that. You know, I think Teddy Roosevelt's old, you know, adage of, you know, speak softly and carry a big stick. On China, we're speaking super loudly right now. Uh, and we're carrying a, a, a stick that's growing smaller because of, of real reductions in the defense budget. So um, I think this is not, should be a more of, of a topic for public discourse these days as well. How do we maintain our deterrent capability? Uh, especially given uh, the increasingly aggressive nature of the Chinese Communist Party that we've seen just in the last couple of years, right? Bludgeoning Indian soldiers to death on the Himalayan frontier, weaponizing islands in the South China Sea, ramming and sinking Vietnamese vessels, 
the constant overflights and aggression toward Taiwan, this announcement the other day that they might start to patrol Taiwanese airspace with, with People's Liberation Army Air Force aircraft, right? I mean, this is a period of extreme danger, I think. And the only way to, I think, prevent the worst from happening is, is as Michelle says, to, to be strong uh, in the region and to be strong with, uh, with allies and partners. I think we but, also, other, I was going to say, I think we also, uh, we obviously have to be <coughs> intently concerned with deterrence by bolstering deterrence being prepared to win a war if God forbid everyone came so that we can hopefully avoid it at all costs. And that's with respect to China or Russia or some of these other threats. But we also have to look at the non-military threats that these uh, countries pose that we need to defend ourselves against and the much higher likelihood that we're going to face those. So, for example, we've got an entire NATO alliance that uh, thinks every day about what we would do if a Russian tank column moved into Estonia and how we would beat it back. That's entirely appropriate. But NATO doesn't look at protection of our own democracies against uh, Russia's uh, meddling in democratic practices through cyber means, as they did in the United States in 2016 and in 2020, as they did in France before their presidential election, as they've done in Britain, as they do in other countries. And yet we, the possibility that that's going to happen is 100 percent because it's happening right now. Same thing on, on China. We have to think about what it would look like if China acted in an aggressive way militarily against one of our allies in the region and what we would do in response to that. Entirely appropriate. But we also have to be thinking at the much higher likelihood they'll engage in the things they already do, like theft of intellectual property through cyber means at vast scale. Um, at uh, surveilling uh, people uh, well beyond their borders and trying to kind of impose their own value system on on other countries and their technological um, way, uh, governance matters and things like that, their economic dominance and their use of economic coercion to try to get the outcomes that they like, including with countries like Australia and things like that. And so we can't leave behind all of the non-military stuff that's happening right now while we prepare for a war that we hope never happens. I want to shift gears uh, and talk a little bit about our economic agenda as it relates to national security. And this is obviously relevant to China, but extends beyond our engagement there. There's been a lot of activity when it comes to a defensive economic strategy. Export controls, CFIUS, Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, uh, sanctions. But there's been little, it seems, on the other side of the ledger uh, when it comes to advancing a positive economic agenda. Uh, Richard, what, what, what do you think we should expect when it comes to proactive economic measures? Not much in the, in the near term because it's caught up in domestic politics, um, but it's a real missing piece. I mean, Michelle mentioned the Trans-Pacific Partnership. There are two, in, in, take Asia, for example, there are two region-wide uh, big trade agreements in Asia. There's TPR, CPTPP now, and there's RCEP, which is the other one. The United States is party to neither of those. China's party to one and what is closer to joining TPP than we are at this point. Um, there's been talk about digital economy agreements. Well, we can't sort of, you know, trade is too controversial now. We're in sort of this protectionist mindset, but maybe we can get digital economy agreements and liberalize digital trade and, uh, you know, show some leadership there, reduce uh, the barriers and things like that. But there's been no effort thus far out of the administration. Um, and the Congress is not particularly pushing this very hard. So I think you're absolutely right. There's all kinds of defensive measures on how to deal with export controls and investment screening and all these other things. Virtually nothing on the on the on the positive side of what would uh, economic leadership in various parts of the world look like, not only for geopolitical reasons, but for no kidding economic reasons at home. Uh, but it's it's too domestically politically difficult now, maybe something after the midterms or in a second term, but we're now seeing, uh, you know, more or less three administrations in a row that are not terribly gung ho on, uh, on the positive economic side yeah. and TPP didn't pass as we know. So. Yeah. Michelle. You know, if I could just jump in, I think there is, you know, an opportunity to make some lemonade out of lemon. And um, when you look at the, the incredible integration of our supply chains globally um, with China. Um, there are areas where, fine, you know, not a big worry, but there are areas that touch on national security, um, that touch on uh, the, our digital economy, that touch on 
um, far, you know, now we have heightened awareness, public health supply chains and pharma supply chains. There are places where we really need to reconsider our vulnerabilities and develop much greater resilience. Some of that may be reshoring things to the United, reshoring things to the United States, but in many, many cases, it's going to be redistributing supply chains in the region. And that's an opportunity for us in terms of absent the trade agreement we wish we had um, to make at least some progress in bolstering the economies of some our key, of our key partners um, by moving some of the supply chains that are currently in China to places like Vietnam or you know pick, pick your favorite ASEAN economy. Um, so I, th I do think there's an opportunity there. But in the meantime, to me, the most important thing we can do economically is actually invest in the drivers of our own competitiveness that are here at home, which science and technology spending, research and development spending, access to higher education, 21st century infrastructure, um, smart immigration policy. I mean, look at the founders of Silicon Valley. You know, half of them are either immigrants or first generation Americans. We benefit from an immigration policy that welcomes, that draws the best and brightest from around the world to this country and then convinces them to stay and make their businesses here and so forth. And we've sort of lost the bubble on that somehow in the last uh, administration and, and, and last few years. So this is, this is an agenda that I think is very, resonates in a post-COVID America. And I think it's, you know, it's very, very important. And as we evaluate these big, in, these big investment bills, the, the two infrastructure bills, the CHIPS Act, we got to make sure that we're investing in, we're placing some big bets in the areas where we need to compete. And we're not just, you know, investing in technology, but we're investing in the human capital that's really going to, you know, help us win the competition in the longer term. I would just say that you know, economic security is national security. Right. And I think just one area I'd like to highlight is an area of energy security, how that relates to carbon emissions and, and climate change. Uh, I think because we, we don't look at the interconnected nature of energy security and national security, that we make some bad decisions, right? I mean, the Biden administration blocked the Keystone Pipeline, which made a lot of sense uh, in terms of protecting the environment and from an energy security perspective, and then greenlighted a Russian pipeline that has profound implications for uh, for, for Russia and Russia's ability to have coercive power uh, over uh, over Europe. And so I think we have to look at the interconnected nature of these problems and make decisions based on informed judgments and ensure in the area of energy in particular that we don't trade our dependence on Middle Eastern oil in the 1970s for a new dependence on fragile supply chains that are dominated and controlled by China as we shift to the next generation uh, energy, energy sources. And in particular, I'm thinking of supply chains related to rare earths and rare earths refinement, battery manufacturing, and so forth. So we have a lot of work to do, I think, from a, a, you know, a economic security perspective, resiliency of supply chains that became too fragile uh, based on maybe unchecked globalization or a bias in favor of efficiency uh, rather than resilience. Uh, and, and, uh, and we have a lot of work to do to catch up to China's weaponizing its authoritarian mercantilist model against us. And this is in areas like the Endless Frontier Act, the CHIPS Act, which are elements of kind of industrial policy, which we don't do particularly well and have to be careful about, uh, but I think are, are fundamentally ne are necessary to compete with, uh, with China's economic aggression. We only have a few minutes left, but I want to touch briefly on one more topic that's generating a lot of headlines these days, and that's space. Uh, of course, historically, space has obviously been the domain of the federal government and programs uh, in defense and, and science. Uh, but now we're watching the competition between Blue Origin and SpaceX and Virgin Galactic play out in real time. Michelle, you recently joined the board of Astrospace. What do you make of the commercialization of space uh, and, and where, it's where is it headed? Well, I, I think it's a very exciting, it is a new frontier, <laughs> um, and it's a very exciting time because I think there's a lot that we can do in space to actually help better manage the planet, particularly when it comes to things like climate change, uh, resource depletion, uh, environmental degradation, and so forth. Um, but it's also a great example where the federal government sort of changed the model and opened the doors to commercial industry with great benefit. I mean, the credit goes here to NASA, 
-hmm. which decided to open up the doors, let commercial industry compete with the traditional defense industry in providing solutions in space. And it, it sort of, it, it really created a market. Um, and now we have not only the, the space companies you've uh, heard of, but some of the ones you haven't heard of yet that are coming up with very interesting new models. And since you mentioned Astra, I mean, Astra's model is to get to daily launch on demand out of a container truck mm -hmm. from anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And they're going to mass, they're mass producing high quality rockets that can put payloads for commercial defense intelligence into bespoke orbits um, and beat, beat the best competitors on price. I mean, that's, a, and when you talk about resilience, you know, when you talk about space becoming a contested domain and needing to, to be able to put assets back into space so we're not blinded, so our GPS doesn't go down, so our communications doesn't go down, et cetera, that re anything that contributes to that resilience has got to be part of our future. So this is one of those areas where I think it's a very exciting time because we've got a lot of new entrants, a lot of new ideas, um, and some real energy behind transforming that sector. General Kelly, I know that you departed the administration before the Space Force uh, was created, but I was wondering if you could tell us anything about the motivation uh, for its creation and, and what we can expect from the Space Force. Well, it, there were a lot of people that were uh, had been encouraging this move for some time. Yeah. Uh, the United States Air Force uh, was uh, doing a, uh, you know, to say the least, a good job in terms of uh, managing assets in space and that kind of thing. But uh, there were certainly people that came on board that argued that uh, it's about time to, to break it out separately. Um, and um, so it wasn't necessarily, uh, and I don't know, if HR, if you remember, I mean, it, there were a lot of good ideas coming into the White House, but it was not necessarily, uh, you know, the president or someone like that who decided we're going to do Space Force. Uh, and there was a lot of discussion about, OK, well, do we really need it now or do we need it at all? Because, you know, the Air Force is, has a separate kind of Space Force and why aren't they doing a good job and all of that? But I think uh, at the end of the day, it was, it's, it's a good decision and it's it's not going to grow into a, a huge organization, not as, not as it need to. I was just up in uh, strategic command up in Omaha last week and the week before, frankly, uh, and uh, a lot of great work being done on, uh, on, on the Space Force. And they're already credible and they'll get even more so. Any final thoughts? Yep. Yeah, I'll just say sometimes the government puts the right person in the right job, you know, and I think, uh, and I think General Raymond and then his deputy, Bill LaCorey, who was our director of defense and worked with the vice president space council to develop, I think, a really sound space strategy that ought to have broad, enduring bipartisan support going into the future. There's an unclassified version and then there's a there, there's a classified version I think is actually quite good. You know, I was kind of agnostic on it, but now that it's done, yeah. I think it was the right decision. Uh, to, to, to split out the, the Space Force because you know, we've got the right people working on, as what Michelle just mentioned, is a, you know, we kind of relate to the game recognizing it's a contested domain. And, and there's so much potential now, uh, thanks to the, to, to the really the, 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 uh, the, the private sector coming up with so many innovative solutions to the, to the problems we have and the opportunities that we have in space. But the, what, the, yeah, uh, the one thing I would add is uh, I think the, the commercialization, the creativity that's been uh, unleashed in this country around uh, space is a, is a good example of the bright side of some of the darkness that we were talking about on this panel. Because when you talk about national security, you, you talk about threats and China and Afghanistan, and it starts to get kind of pessimistic. I think that it's a good example because Everything that the United States needs to compete in this new world that we're entering, whether it's China or deal with the threats around there, what we already have, we have the strongest, most powerful, richest, most creative, most innovative country in the world with a, a, an attractive democratic system, lots of friends around the world. It's about putting those pieces together and drawing on our strongest, our greatest strengths as Americans that's going to win on across this whole swath of stuff. So it. It, on the one hand, it's daunting when you spend, you know, most of your hour talking about all the threats and all the problems in the world. But the encouraging side is, as Americans, we're in the lucky place of if we just right. are better versions of ourselves, then we'll be able to deal adequately, if not excellently, across the whole spectrum of them. Richard, thank you for helping us to end on a uh, <laughs> positive note. I have one final question this morning. This was a special request. I won't say from whom. Uh, it's for General Kelly, and you can answer in just a sentence or less. 
Uh, General, tell us, what was it like to fire Anthony Scaramucci? <laughs> well, of all of the things I did at the White House, it was certainly the most enjoyable thing. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. <laughs>